Hello, children. Come sit with Granny while I tell you a story. The tut tut Who is that? The delivery lady with the tall black hat. Bringing frog and toad pizza, barbecued rat, and roadkill panini squashed down flat. <laughs> The sky is dark, the night is young, the firmament with stars is strong. The time is right, the time has come, the witches are arriving. Slowly up the mountainside, above the tops of trees, they glide. As to their rendezvous, they ride, the witches are arriving. There was a scrabbling and a sizzling in the corner of the kitchen, and from underneath the cooker, like two red evening shadows, slid two demons pulling and striding themselves and popping out like corks. There was one great big fella and one teeny little one. They stood up, stretching and yawning and looking around, and then they spotted the dead witch. They scampered up to the corpse and poked at it with glee. Then the big demon seized the dead witch by the feet gave a yank and, and, and like a rabbit stripped off all of her skin at one pull. Then he said to the little demon, here, you take the flesh for yourself. Lug it under the cooker. Well, the little girl, she sat there as still as still can be, watching while the little demon flung his arms around the skinless corpse of her grandmother and dragged it under the big iron stove. a coach to get you to the castle. A pumpkin is the usual conveyance, I believe. Well, I have got a pumpkin, but I've already used the insides in the stew and I've, I've carved it into a lantern for Halloween, said Papa Liliac. It's got eyes and a big grinning mouth and everything. Why, that will be perfect. Now for the horses, we need two black rats and two bats for the coachman. Papa Liliac fetched them and placed the animals on the ground in front of the pumpkin. I waved my wand over the lot. Antrenor de Voriac! The jack-o'-lantern swelled and expanded. The Halloween eyes became windows and the big brass wheels appeared from underneath, raising up the coach which burst into light as a swarm of fireflies flew in and arranged themselves on the ceilings and walls. Transformare equina! The two rats stretched and bucked, black plumes sprouting from their heads, and their sleek black backs rising up, the girths and traces wrapping around them, the bits slipping into their mouths and the reins, reaching backwards like tendrils towards the coachman's box. Lilietchi de Cocher! The two bats stood upright, grew taller and folded their wings into leather capes as they took up the reins in their leather-gloved hands and settled themselves onto the box. Their black hair slipped back from their black foreheads their black eyes shining. Well, I think you're all set to go, I said to an astonished Papa Liliac, as two more little bats settled into her hair, adding the final touch. Enjoy yourself, but be back by midnight, I warned. These things can't keep up their metamorphosis for long. Go on now, knock them dead. Suddenly, there was a ripping sound as if someone heavy had sat down in an old deck chair and the canvas was giving way. The squire's wife staggered to her feet and stood there, swaying. She lifted her skirts and looked down between her thighs. The squire stared in horror as she was rent from navel to tail and the head of a huge hare appeared. It turned to look at him. Its eyes red with fire and its teeth sharp as needles. Then the shoulders was out and with a whoop, the massive thing landed on the ground, its coat sleek and glistening with blood. The squire stared mutely at the ghastly scene, but now he was coughing and choking. And there was another sound of tearing and cracking as his jaws was forced impossibly wide. A pink nose appeared, 
than a hare lip and teeth as sharp as needles, then two big eyes red with fire and pop, pop, two long ears. Then came the front paws. The thing clambered out from the ruin of his face and the shoulders, the torso, and then the back legs and the tail was all out in a rush. The twin hares looked at one another. Then they ate up what was left of the squire and his wife and leapt through the window, out into the moonlight and off across the fields. Well, I can see the light of the torch again and then there was a scraping sound and a bump and I knew they'd got my apple picking ladder and put it up against the wall. Well, I could smell the sweat and the beer and fags on them from by the kitchen door. Well, there's a scrambling, a fumbling, and a big fat head appears in the window. I could see him scrutinising the window frame, doing a recce, seeing if it would fit. I made sure he'd fit through it. Now, he put his arm through first, then his head and his shoulders come through, squeezing, but just making it in. I don't think he'd really thought about what would happen on this side. He, he wriggles and squirms, just like you see a greasy pig do at the fair, then... All of a sudden, he was through. The bottom half of him just seemed to whiz through like when he squeezes the soap. And there he was, hanging upside down by shoelaces from the window catch. I adjusted the position of the salt barrel with my foot. Now he was heavy man, so the shoelaces didn't last long. I leaned against the door frame and rolled with a fag in the meantime. Now he made an attempt to right himself, and then there was a snap. And he fell, plop, head first into the salt barrel. I was over there on the second. I pushed his legs in, fastened the lid tight and sat on it. Now his mate was looking down at the window and he sees what I was doing. He tried to follow the first burglar, but the window wouldn't stretch for him. He could only get his head in or his fist. As he pulled back, I saw his big, ugly, pasty face in the moonlight and he saw mine. I grinned. And then something else come up the ladder behind him and pulled him down. Well, it was a full moon and I'd heard Leonard growling as he ran through the herb garden and now he's hungry. Well, you can't make a leopard change its spots, can you? You can't stop a cat from eating little birds and mice. And I'm just saying, drop it, drop it, Leonard, to a werewolf isn't going to get you very far. I'm sitting on the salt barrel and it rocks for a bit, but then it stops. I just had time to turn the cream jug upside down and catch something pale and wispy as it curled up out of a knot hole, like, like milk pouring upwards. I set it down on the shelf with a little weighted crochet cover over it, and I went back to my knitting. So now I'm looking forward to a nice bit of ham at Christmas. Well, I'd better go and check on those soul cakes. I should be done by now. I'll put them in the larder for Monday in case anyone comes souling. Now remember, flour, fat, sugar, currants, egg yolks, and if you want real soul cakes, the special ingredient from the cream jug. As soon as Margarita saw the mice and the bats, the worms and the weevils, the beetles and the bugs rushing into the room, she began to stamp all around her, crushing the smallest who were unable to get away in time. Baba Yaga's son was the last to arrive and his smile fell when he heard his mother screaming and heard his brothers and sisters being ground into the floor. Well, it was all over in a second. He lifted one of his great anvil-like feet and dropped it down again. All that was left of Margarita was a pulpy stain in the middle of the floor. Hee-haw, hee-haw, the witches are arriving.